Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth and final session of the evening. Hello to everyone attending live in person at the Extreme Hangout, and to all of our digital attendees uh, joining us live online. Uh, my name is Mitch from One Young World, and it's my pleasure to introduce this next incredible session. Um, I just also wanted to let you know that on the screen we're going to have a uh, code that's going to appear, and so you can write there. So uh, for all of you attending live uh, in person, but also online, you'll be able to put that into slido.com, where you'll be able to submit your questions throughout the session. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcome this next session called The Power of Investing Youth-Led Solutions, hosted by the YMCA. Uh, and give me uh, a round of applause for our panelists, uh, Mike Bromfield, Rebecca Nikunde, Rodrigo Putriano, Shaquille Karim, and Alicia O'Sullivan. Hey everyone, hello, and hello everyone joining us online. Uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction, Mitch. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here on the stage with four of a group of 20 incredible YMCA ambassadors that have been joining us at COP26 as official observers inside the Blue Zone, but also as a group of young activists, campaigners, leaders in their own right, that all over the world have been leading climate change initiatives, have been lobbying, campaigning, and really just shining stars. Uh, we were talking uh, before this panel uh, that we're gonna try our best to keep it quite positive. We've framed the panel in quite a positive light, uh, but do forgive us if we get a bit emotional. Um, we've said it is a possibility, it's been a long day, and I also appreciate that this is day nine of 12 at COP, it's a long couple of weeks, so I think people are flagging. We've had some late nights. So just take a moment, breathe before we go into. That was as much for me as anything else, to be perfectly honest. Um, so over the, the next hour, we're going to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the power of investing in youth-led solutions. Now, to give some context to that, uh, a year ago, YMCA invested $250,000 into 35 climate action solutions that have been completely designed by young people all over the world. In the 12 months since that, then, they have not wasted a single minute in doing some pretty incredible things with that cash and the mentorship and the time that was invested. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that both Rebecca and Rodrigo and Shaquille uh, were three of the grantees that received some funding from that. We, in the last 12 months, have also made a short film, and I'll talk a bit about that later on too as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, we're going to do some questions at the end of the panel. Um, and for those that are watching online, uh, please let us know where in the world you're joining us from, be active in the chat, and share your questions with us as well. So over to you guys. Going along, just introduce yourselves for us. I think we should start with Shaquille. You'd like to start with Shaquille. Okay, we'll start and then we'll come back this way. Fine. Well, good, e good evening, everybody. Sorry about that. I'm like getting used to stage presence. My name is Shaquille Kareem. I am originally from San Francisco, California. I currently reside in London. I'm pursuing a PhD in something called political demography and its connection to uh, climate change. So I think I'm at the right spot for this. Great. Um, my name's Alicia O'Sullivan. Um, I'm from West Cork in Ireland. Um, and I'm a second year law student in University College Cork. And yeah, very happy to be here. Thank you, everyone. My name is Rodrigo Puntriano, and I'm here all the way from Peru. I am the coordinator of a youth-led solution called Sumakmuru. Um, well, we transform plastic waste into sanitary facilities for people without proper access to water and sanitation. Sorry for that. And I'm also part of the YMCA international delegation here at COP. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Rebecca Nkunde. I'm a Zambian from Africa. I'm sure. Everybody wonders, where is Africa in the, in the map? Yeah, somewhere central. <laughs> so um, I'm also leading a team of highly enthusiastic 
young people back at home who are also transforming plastic into a lot of sustainable uh, daily usable products and are trying to make money out of it to support the less privileged youth in my community. You're all incredibly modest, firstly, uh, and hopefully over the next 50 minutes we can uh, bring some more out of you. Um, but thank you very much for your introductions. I promise that we keep it positive, but I'm going to just start off with a big question that I think reflects the mood and some of the sentiments that you've shared with me over the, the last 12 days, uh, not 12 days, but it, maybe it felt like it. This panel's about the power of investing in youth-led solutions. Shaq, does that reflect our experiences of COP so far? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, youth is a big term that's being used right now at the Blue Zone um, and in media in general. And it's, we, it's very performative. We want to say it. We want to have youth and young people at the front. But in practice, I don't feel, and I'm not witnessing a huge amount of youth involvement. It's relatively exclusive. What do you think, Alicia? Yeah, um, it was something I actually spoke about with some other Irish activists here this morning. Um, and we actually got the chance to talk to our Minister for Environment and express how we felt about COP and just how inaccessible it can be. Um, like, we're lucky enough and privileged enough to be here. Um, and that's how difficult it's been for us. So, like, you can't even imagine what it's like, you know, for people who couldn't get to COP because of various inequality issues. Um, but from the programming to the timing to, you know, young people I know not being allowed into negotiation rooms, being told they have the wrong badge, which is kind of funny when you're there to observe and you're told you have the wrong badge to observe. Um, so it's just, it's, I think it's been a series of very, a, a lot of difficulty um, for young people trying to understand and grasp what COP is and what it's really about. Um, and, and, you know, that's just for people who are here. So it's, it's, I can't even imagine, you know, people who are not here, how, how much of a struggle that is, you know. I personally think that a lot of people or leaders are using the word youth as like a password to open certain doors. So yeah, we're being used a lot. Youth, youth, youth. But in the reality, it's not really what's on the ground. So COP has so many question marks for me. Yeah. Uh, I think you've touched on a really interesting point. And you know, for, for me, we've, we've spent a long time planning to be at COP. Um, you know, and putting youth-led solutions and, and young leaders at the forefront in the most meaningful and engaging way that we can. But I also know from our team how hard it's been to try and draw more attention to that. And we're very grateful to uh, the Extreme Hangout and to One Young World who have given this forum to have this conversation. But I know that the press haven't been listening. You know, where's, where's the article in the, the, the international press about the work you're, you guys are doing? And so, Alicia, you, you mentioned uh, earlier about you know, the importance of having a seat at the table. And we're talking about doing that in a, a meaningful way. But does it always have to be meaningful? Is, is there something in tokenism? Okay, so <laughs> I want to preface this with that I don't support tokenism, right? But um, I guess it's something that young people really fear when we engage with politicians and government and organizations who approach us that we're being taken seriously and that it's meaningful and sustainable and that we're not all just being dragged into a room being asked a couple of questions and then you leave an hour later after a photo op and nothing comes of it so that's something that i think a lot of us are really conscious of but in another sense this is the system that is currently in place and to get a seat at the table, sometimes you have to fold and sometimes I have to stand in a photo that I would probably prefer not to be in. But to be there and to have the voices heard of young people in Ireland, you know, because that's obviously where I'm from, or from rural Ireland, or to speak on a certain issue that may not necessarily get into a room. So for example, as a young person, right, there's a certain tokenism in that the politician wants the picture with the young person, not maybe necessarily the farmer who 
in my local community is trying to um, transition and trying to be greener, but is finding that extremely difficult. But they're not going to get a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our minister, right? So there's something to be said for me being in that room and being able to express some of these opinions, just like my fellow panelists have done in their own respective areas. So, you know, you uh, as a young person, I think it's difficult because you're thrown into a world of politics and media that a lot of people never experience in their lives and some people not until they're long down the road into their professional careers. So I guess it's just about being strategic about what you're saying. And you know, Greta is a really good example, I think, of someone who is strategic. Every word that comes out of her mouth is well thought out and planned, right? There's nothing that she says that doesn't have some strong meaning behind it and is you know pretty directed at someone which you know is is how we need to think about when we're interacting with you know politicians and government does anyone else want to come in on that at all yeah i think i really uh something that i wanted to address is like you see me here in a suit today because every day i go in the blue zone i wear this suit to pass and get access through a lot of things and it, it just gives me privilege um, and I am a, I look like a compliant citizen, right? I am the model person that government would want on their team to talk to. And I think we, we have this polarization, either you're a Greta and you're an activist and you're radical, or maybe you're looking at a little bit like me or anyone else who's downing professional wear. Um, that's not how it should be. That's not inclusive. That's not um, the future. And so I think this, problem we have, we have to kind of comply to the system to change it, and we think that we're going to, and then some t somewhere down the line, it kind of changes us. Does anybody, any of you feel that way? Yeah, I, I mean, it's funny. I, I used to be a youth worker back in the day, um, and, you know, we'd always have lengthy conversations about what you, what do you wear as a facilitator to, I mean, Shaq and I were coordinating uh, what we were going to wear on this panel today. He's opted for the suit, so I've opted for the casual, um, so he could make that point. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, I, I think that you've, you've touched on something quite important, which is about compliant, the, the polarization. You're either compliant or you're an activist. Yeah, and you know, we were talking about this, is that sometimes I think our generation turns on each other yeah. and it becomes really competitive and it becomes about the image, um, about what your performance is like, what is on your Instagram, right? What is, who are you following on Twitter? How many followers do you have? And uh, I guess that's one shallow way to mark some change, but I think the, how the system, how the power imbalance has turned this generation against one another into this weird dichotomy of a follower or a rebel, I, I'm noticing a lot, a lot of that right now in Glasgow. Thanks, Shaq. Um, if anyone wants, Shaq wrote a blog uh, about s some of this uh, that we're talking about right now, ymca.int slash COP26, uh, if you want to go and take a look. And actually, all, all of these uh, guys here with me have been writing their reflections up of their time here. Um, I want to talk about the, t the panel title, Investing in Youth-Led Solutions, doesn't just mean money. Now, money is incredibly important to be able to fund some of the work and initiatives that you've been doing. But investment means mentorship, it means elevating, it means bringing people to the table. Um, and R Rebecca, I wonder if you can come in on this, because you're, you're here with us, you've, you've travelled from Endola, uh, and... You, you're working in schools with young people. Could you bring some of their voices to this conversation? Because you're, you, you bring a really unique insight as a secondary school teacher. Yes, so as a teacher, um, I work a lot with the young people. And mostly what I've just discovered is they lack information. I, I believe that in order to change anything, people have to understand what, what's going on. People have to know what they're going to change. So making an impact in these lives and teaching them, educating them on a daily basis what exactly we're doing and why we're doing it has been a special thing to me because I have seen the enthusiasm, I have seen the power and the impact of just one session of sitting down with those kids, what it has done in their lives and how they've reciprocated the, the education they've gotten 
in one session. And I think it will go a long way. Like you said, it's not just about investing money. Really, you can bring money to the table, but if you don't really have time and give somebody the attention that they deserve, then your money will go to waste. These people need to feel like they are part of the society, like they're important to the governments around the world. That is only when you will see them responding to everything that's taking place. And I've just wanted to bring to the attention of everybody here that it's the small things that matter. It's the minority that's important because the majority can actually speak for themselves, but the minority can't. So what's, what's really the importance of us having big gatherings where we just show off our, our money, our status and all that when we're neglecting the people that are going to carry on with the dream? So I've been going around schools. I've, I work with a lot of poor communities back at home and just realize that people really don't know what climate change is. But, and, and then that they are the solution to climate change. Because a lot of these people have got ideas that these rich people don't have and never even thought of. So if we invest in trying to you know, make dreams of these people come true and finding out what exactly is in their hearts, we're going to discover that we're going to change the world. There's gonna be an impact, like a huge impact that we're going to make at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a point well made. And yeah, that, that definitely deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, and actually, let's, let's use this opportunity to just take a quick look at some of the work that Rebecca's been doing uh, with YMCN Dollar in Zambia. Let's hold our hands together, inviting against the crime engine, because this is our world. If we don't do anything, then we are going to destroy it. Thank you for everyone who has worked with us on this project. Let's work together in the future. Let's continue doing what we're doing. The message is being spread across. Work is being seen. So you'll be able to see the full version of that tonight at 7 o'clock. So stick around. Uh, and um, you touched on the voices of the minority, and I think that we all feel quite deeply that uh, a lot of voices have been missing from the negotiation rooms, from Glasgow in general, when it comes to this. I haven't heard even that many locals, to be honest, in the conversation when we think about that we're here in Glasgow. Um, Rodrigo, you're doing some incredible work uh, in Peru, uh, in Arequipa, which is about... Uh, it's quite a long way away from Lima, but could you could you tell me a little bit about the journey around working with Nicole and Felipe and and some of those voices? Well, I'll be happy to. Uh, so we're working at Equipa, which is the southern region in my country, and I, I was thinking well, as Rebecca was speaking. Um, so a little bit of context, right? We work in Arequipa with a f we, with many families that do, do not have ac proper access to water and sanitation. Um, every now and then a truck comes with water and they have to purchase it and they have to keep it and then use it every day. They have to walk to these faucets where water is available for a few hours a day and then get it for, for, for their houses and personal use. And we were recording a, a, a video just like this one, and we interviewed Nicole, which is a middle-aged mo mother that um, she's dedicated to her children and her family. And we asked her like, what was what she considered to be the impact of climate change? Not exactly on those words, but so, sort of. And she broke into tears and told us that she had not been able to cook for her children for the past 15 days that she had not access to water. And I could only think about my privileges and I go walk to a damn faucet and I open it and our water comes out and I don't even think about it and we take it for granted. Uh, the impact on climate change for these people, it's on their daily life. They may not be aware of the science behind it, they may be not aware of the 2 point degrees, 1.5 degrees, they, they don't care. They just don't have water, they don't, they don't have houses, their environment is getting destroyed. That is what they care about, and that's the people that is struggling. 
Uh, if we could take a look at, I think, as well, just to uh, explain a little bit more around it and a, a little insight into the work that you've been doing with people like Nicole and Felipe. La Mampía es un pueblito que está lleno de piedritas que recién está poblando. Y en el aspecto de, del agua es más que todo la deficiencia, agua y desagüe. La crisis climática a todos nos incomoda. El proyecto es un más muro, eh, estamos haciendo ladrillos, ecoladrillos. Un ecoladrillo, como su nombre lo indica, es un ladrillo ecológico que está hecho puramente de plástico. Aproximadamente mil ecoladrillos se necesitan para crear una ecobase. Una ecobase es una infraestructura sanitaria hecha con ecoladrillos. En el proyecto trabajamos la economía circular y lo hacemos en base a tres pilares, en aprender, en transformar, pero sobre todo en inspirar. Por eso es que el proyecto significa buena semilla. Thank you. Something, something I would like to add is that this echo base, as we call it, is going to be connected in, and I'm saying it's going to be because it's already scheduled for December, we're going to build it, and um, it's going to be connected to a biodigester. So the little water that, it, that is needed to use the echo bathrooms um, is going to be filtered, and green areas are going to flourish around it. I actually was on a plane coming here. And, and I received the bottle, and I decided I would make him make a brick myself. And this is, thank you, thank you. Because I, I, I looked at this bottle and I said, I, I really want to take this with me everywhere. And I want to show people what I'm capable of, of doing. And I want to tell them that, um, that this is what is going to change Nicole's life. And, and you know what bothers me the most? I had to go through security every day, and every time I go through, they think it's rubbish. And I'm so pissed off. And I'm exhausted to explain this is not rubbish. I'm exhausted. This is not rubbish. The future. This is you the see? future. It's not rubbish. Mm -hmm. We're making this to help these people. Yes. This is what we're doing. And this is a youth-led solution. Thank you. Thank you Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, now, this, this question probably, uh, hearing you talk with so much passion, I feel like I know the answer already, so I, I'm going to put it to the whole panel. You know, for us, we, we see the importance of when, when we invest, right? When we, when we actually properly invest in youth-led solutions. But also, we talked about tokenism, we've talked about youth being the secret password to make it seem like we're being inclusive. Um, does that make you feel burdened? It does, a whole lot. Because we feel like, um, at the center of it all is somebody else's interest, yet we are the gateway to whatever somebody else needs, okay? It's a huge burden because everybody's looking to the youth. Everybody's looking to the youth because the youth are the topic, okay? But the truth of the matter is they're not even in the circle that is making decisions, okay? It's a huge burden and it's a, it's a big lie that we have to like get out of and we, let's come to the truth. If we want to use the youth in the forefront, let's invest in them. Let's trust them to lead also because there's something in us that the world needs. But then when we are just left dormant, nobody's going to know the potential that is in the youth. Let's not just use them as, like I said, a password. In order to get into an iPhone, you need a passcode. We're not a passcode. We're the next generation that's going to bring change. We're the next generation that's going to unite the entire world if used appropriately. If we are trusted with the world and the planet at large, yeah. That was great. Chuck? Yeah, I th actually, I just kind of want to acknowledge a few things. So, like, one, 
using like a lock, you can hear my California accent. Um, I'm from the global north, I'm from America. My country is responsible for uh, stealing land, enslaving people, committing genocide, and allowing its private businesses and vested interests continue to exploit and hurt people all over the world. And I'm a citizen of that nation. And I'm sitting here on a stage with people who are directly affected from my consumership as being a citizen of my nation. So I'm part of the problem, right? And I think th the solutions have to come from people who are most vulnerably affected, whose land have been exploited. It's, there are people maybe in my country that have great ideas that they can push forward. But I really think we need to give the Global South it, some real attention and give it power to actually lead us the way forward because the Global North has really, really, I think, messed this up. Uh, and uh, Alicia, you, uh, you, what a, I don't want to go too negative, so we are going to bring it back round. I promise that we wouldn't go too negative, um, we, because I, I do, I do want us to focus on you know, the, the positive side of this conversation, because I feel that actually coming to COP, admittedly, I'm, I don't have accreditation. I'm not in the blue zone with you, <laughs> right? which I imagine can be draining, but this recharges my batteries. I will leave COP remembering this, remember the interactions that I've had with people like you, and that gives me the energy to go home and carry on, you know, when it, when it all feels so negative. And I, I hope that you all feel the same, that, it, that in some way it recharges all of your batteries as well. Um, but before I move to the completely positive, um, what is it that we're afraid of, though? What is it, what is it that is driving this for you? I know Rodrigo touched on it, Alicia. Do you, do you have some thoughts around what is it that's actually driving you to do your work? Well, first of all, I'd like to not be here in like 10 years time. I'd like to be at home and not having to talk about this anymore or spend like 90% of my life stressing about climate change and trying to do as much as I can as a citizen, as a student, as a young person. Um, and I, I really feel with what Rodrigo was saying um, and, and the whole idea of it being a burden, right? Um, although I, I, I feel so supported as a young person in Ireland through YMCA, through different groups, through my college, I, I just feel like this whole concept of responsibility isn't fair on young people. And I think we put a lot on them. We put so much pressure on, you know, on so much spotlight, which is good. But the, the, the sense of you have to lead the way, you're the future. Like, why, why do we have to do it? <laughs> like, wh why, why, why us? Like, why can't it be all of us? Or why can't you help us? Rather than saying those kind of terms that make us feel so much pressure. And I, I just think, I remember I was talking about it this morning because some other girl referenced how she was never in school. In Ireland, there's like a two years where you, you're finishing school. And I remember I failed a maths test in fifth year because I was never in school. Because <laughs> I was always, you know, trying to do as much as I can. And my teacher wrote on the top of the test in big red marker, the environment will still be there in six months' time. <laughs> and I was like... Will it? <laughs> like, I was so frustrated that, you know, people didn't really understand why I was doing what I was doing um, and, and I guess what I was doing. And um, I guess, look, there's, there's obviously been so much support for me as well. It was just kind of a one-off experience, thankfully. But the, the lack of understanding, I think, about what we do, which is so great when it comes to, you know, we're not talking about money when we're talking about investing in young people giving them the space to learn from each other and to understand us and really have time and respect for what we're doing because I know that, you know, and you can you can feel the passion, you can feel that people really care about this and that people have dedicated their lives to this and a lot of their time. And I think the, the pressure that we feel sometimes is really misunderstood by adults and people in power 
And I think that's why young people are angry a lot of the time uh, because we don't feel that, we don't feel understood. Um, well, we don't feel like our anger is understood, I guess. So to bring it round to the positive, <laughs> okay. What, one, what does it look like when we, when we invest in youth-led solutions, when we actually properly invest in the work that you're doing, the people that you know are doing, and how can I help? All right, that's eyes are on me, so I'll take this one. Um, I actually agree on most of what Alicia has said, but I do believe we have to talk about money. Because, I mean, I, I didn't came up with this for, for free, I mean, I, I did it because I'm volunteer volunteering, no one is paying for my time, but but it cost me. It costed me time, it costed a lot of other volunteers their time. We broke our minds to, to not to get this, because actually this we didn't invent it. It, it was really simple, but um, in my country there's actually another association that works with this. They have thousands of this and they don't know what to do with it. So basically our most of our time was in, in the big, 3D blog that you saw there over there, and coming up with where are we going to put it, how is it going to be designed, um, we don't have water, what do we do? We <laughs> want to create a bathroom, what are we going to do about that? And, and I believe we are very talented people, young people, volunteering our time, our, our resources, our money even, to, to get this done. So I do believe that we should talk about um, all of those things, and we do. I do believe we should talk about money uh, uh, anyway. Um, because, and, and I said that this the other day, like, we are gonna make mistakes. Like, you probably we're gonna invest some money and we're, sometimes we're gonna screw up and we're gonna, we're gonna get success eventually. I mean, success is built up on a lot of failure. So uh, if we have 35 young youth-led solutions, sorry with the English, youth-led solutions, like um, most of them, and I can assure you that, most of them are, go are gonna succeed because they have the resources to focus some of their time to get that done. Uh, and I believe we don't need 35 of them. I believe we need more. We need many more. And, um, and I, I believe you, you dropped the question on how would the world look like. So I think, I think had we invested in youth-led solutions long ago, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't need COP. We wouldn't need it. Like, why would we need that? We're discussing on something of solutions are out there, as, uh, as, as Alicia was saying. And, and, and we can do that. I mean, I, I honestly want to believe that investing in youth-led solutions will, will get us out of here as soon as possible. Just to add on, I come from a place, I'm sure everybody has a picture of Africa, where ev I assume others even think people don't wear clothes there. They just run around in sack clothes and, uh, and all that. Yeah, there are levels of poverty that are so alarming and part of the reason why these things are happening is climate change. So people are so poor that they are depending on natural resources to actually earn a living. There are people in the villages that got cut down trees to make charcoal and sell to people in the urban areas to use, okay? So if these youth-led solutions are funded, I'm positive that there's gonna be a reduction in poverty levels and levels of unemployment because they are super high where I come from. And it's not just about uh, unemployment and all of that. It's also about empowering people to actually depend on themselves and depend less on donor funding and all of that, which is what we need. So give me a start and I will show you what I do with that. That's, that's what I believe. Give somebody a fishing rope and they'll go and fish and feed their family. If you give them food every time, they'll come back begging. We're not beggars. We don't want to beg. We want to be empowered, okay? We don't want to keep asking for people. Can we have this? Can we have this? Can we have that? We want somebody to trust us with finances or any help that we can get to go fishing and put food on our tables. I've seen women that are eager to provide for their families. I've seen young people that are taking care of their families, but they just don't have the starting point. 
give them the starting point and they will take care of themselves. You will no longer have to come back and give them all over and over again. It's impossible for us to go anywhere because where I come from, lending facilities will lend you money at a very high interest rate. What's that? That's like joking with you. That's, it's not even going to take you anywhere. You're going to be working. If Rodrigo lends me 50 pounds, I'll be working for Rodrigo for the rest of my life. I'll be paying him back. Okay. But if you lend me money at a zero interest rate, I will work to benefit my family and also to bring development in a country. So this is what we're looking at. Don't look at it as a youth-led solution that is just for the youth. Look at it on a larger scale that it's going to bring development to nations. It's going to save lives. It's going to feed people. It's going to take education to far, far places that cannot get an education. It's going to take electricity in bushes. It's going to do all sorts of things because it's a solution. And an example of people that are bringing solutions to the world are people like us sitting in front here. And so many more that did not make it here. Because to get to this place, it's about, in my currency, 30,000 kwacha a ticket, which is I don't know how much in, in, in pounds. I could not afford it. My organization did it. Imagine there are people out there who've got the ideas and who've got voices that should be heard that could not afford a 30,000 kwacha. Okay, so there are all these limits and barriers that restrict the youth from achieving their dreams and from being powerful. There are all these things that stop nations from growing and being great. Barriers. We need to break those barriers and be one family because doing it individually and, you know, in classes, oh, we're America, we can be in the same level with Zambia. It's not going to get us anywhere. I need somebody in this room to tell me how many of you have got blue blood or green blood. You are an American, I'm an African, but is your blood purple? We're, we've got red blood, right? I can't cut myself to show you that I've got red blood. So the bottom line is we're all human beings before we're anything else. You can have a different hair color, you can have a different skin color, but you're a human being. Can you walk on two legs? Yes. Do you have two arms? Yes. Do you have two eyes? Yes. That is all that matters. So let's hold hands, work together, and fund all support emotionally, physically, psychologically, in any way that you could support somebody who's bringing change regardless of how they look like, of what you think of them. It doesn't really matter. What matters is we're a human race who will be extinct if we don't work together. There are no intelligent people and less intelligent people. We all have giftings in different ways. So if I am gifted to teach, he is gifted in another way. And if we come together, it's going to be an atomic bomb. But if we keep on separating one another and thinking, okay, we're more special, we're more superior, we're poor, we can't do this, we can't do that, it's not going to take us anywhere. This whole earth will blow up in our face and let's see where we're going to go with our color and our money. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, just, I just get a little bit emotional at, at how sometimes we just, we just think a bit less, okay? We drive uh, our minds and our attention to things that really don't matter. That's, that's not even important. We're talking about climate change. People are growing old and Somebody mentioned there should be a succession process. Old people. Because I'm getting old. Yeah. So. And same. I'm going to take over from you. So. You are. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important that you 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 start to more like train me to take over from you. Let's take over from the older generations. Pick it up from where they left off. Yeah, because I can't just get you can't just go here, guys. Your turn now. Mm -hmm. Was, where, where's, where's the point in that? I mean, again, it just comes back to the exact point. Yes. I have to invest in the people that are coming exactly. through. Exactly. So I could take the whole day to talk because I'm a teacher, but I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna let you digest. And I could listen to you all day as well. No, I love it. Um, I, I love your voice. Just what I, I'm, I'm conscious that um, I'd like to, to bring in some questions from the audience in the room as well as the audience that are watching online as well. Uh, so if you have a question uh, and you're watching online, head to Slido for us so we can bring through your voices. Please let us know where it is you're from in the world as well. I always think that's really helpful to, to know. Um, 
But first, just to those in the room, while those online have a moment to think about that, does, does anybody have a question for, their, for our panel or any that they'd like to put forward? If you stick your hand up, we'll, um, we'll get a mic brought to you. Over at the back. Hi, uh, sorry if this isn't a well thought out question because I'm anything, uh, but um, f what I've seen from being in the Blue Zone myself and Shaquille's blogs is um, that it's not accessible for like English as a second language to ask questions. It's not the most accessible for you know disabled people. And it, we know the solutions, that's the thing. I'm not asking you what the solutions are because we know those people tell us. I'm asking how do you think we can make them want to implement them like they took accessible buildings and they made them less accessible like in the blue zone how do you i don't know how do you think you can make them listen to make it inaccessible how do we how do we get people to listen i think it's a great question yeah i'll take that go um okay so yeah the hypocrisy of cop is so real it's like, I don't understand why we're in canvas tents blasting heat. Like, is it coming from renewable sources? I don't think so, but um, I think, so I just want to give a little bit of context, right? So like, for example, like I follow like the climate financing. I, that's what I do. I research climate financing, which is incredibly difficult. I'm well educated. I'm pretty privileged. And I find it really confusing to understand the legal text behind it. So I cannot imagine and English is my first language. I cannot imagine if English is your second language and you don't have this full education, how confusing and limiting that is. So just as some basic context in these delegations or negotiations. The question was, how do, I get, how do we get them to cultivate interest, right, in the actual solution? You know, I'm gonna take it back to Rebecca's point and I think really focusing on poverty is a good start because one big thing that keeps on happening is that the developed North creates a lot of money for the developing countries to have access to in the form of loans with high interest payments. So we have people making money off of climate change. Hmm. So that doesn't seem like a way forward for humanity. It seems like a way forward for a certain group of people. And I think, you know, I'm gonna also tie in one of your questions about what scares me. What scares me is that, are we facing this human extinction? Yes, but I think it's more like, who is gonna go extinct if we don't rise up? Because I have a pretty good feeling, we all talked about this earlier today, that the big money are already making plans to stay alive and stay well as much as they can. And I think it's the people who have no voices and no agency that won't. So to answer your question, I think it takes really um, these kind of conversations, a solution. Someone like me who is from a country that has committed a lot of harm needs to own up to that. They need to be honest with their history about what they've done so they can have conversations with people that they have indirectly affected. And they know that they are contributing to these, uh, buying into these problems and hurting these people. So like in my country, I vote with my money. Whatever I buy, I support. I now can be more conscious of what I buy. And in a capitalist society that shifts, right, the interests. So I think it, it's different depending on what type of uh, political structure your country is. But to get people to listen comes down to these really simple one-to-one -one conversations of empathy, which I think is one of the big speeches that came out of COP from young people's open your hearts. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Shaq. Thank you. Let's, um, Tressa, do we have some questions from the digital platform? Do we have a, a mic for Teresa? Thank you. Hello, thank you. We have some brilliant interactions from our digital audience. Um, a number of them are coming in around investment. So the first one was from Marina from Croatia. How can we ensure that there is no bias when it comes to investment? Excellent question. How do we ensure there is no bias when it comes to the investment? It's very difficult to ensure that there's no biasness because um, we're humans. We're humans. And then there will be people that would think uh, this country. So let's see. Uh, Shaquille just said there will be people that will survive the climate change extinction. And there are people that have already probably even made uh, a planet for themselves 
somewhere where we don't know where they will run to when this whole thing just goes south. In the same way that people prioritize themselves over others, the same way they are going to be financing those things. They will have uh, a criteria to follow that will not favor other people. This is why we're still calling out and crying out that there shouldn't be any of that. We cannot assure that there will be fairness in the way they give out all this uh, financial assistance, but our outcry or our dream, our future, should be more about the world we're living in together. So even the urgency of funding and giving out should be, should follow the, what should I say? It should follow the most hit. Like I said, the minority. The minority are the ones that need to be represented as compared to the majority. The majority will speak for themselves and before they could even speak, they'll be heard. But the minority won't. So I would wish and love to see that even as uh, these projects are being funded, we m look at the minority first as compared to the majority. And you said something that's going to stick with me. Before they even speak, they are being heard. Do we have, a, do we have another one in the room? Over, over here? Thank you. Um, you've spoken very powerfully about um, the self-interest, particularly Shaquille, of um, kind of Western nations and so on. Is there anything that you have seen in the negotiations or that you've observed? Have you seen courage? Or have you seen sparks of hope? Or have you seen people who are stepping out of that self-protectionist agenda? I see courage every day, absolutely. I mean, I think there are groups of people that are walking around, in representatives of indigenous nations, that are walking in their traditional wear amongst a bunch of suits, like myself, and um, standing out, right, in an area and in a country that they probably are unfamiliar with, that takes a lot of courage to do that. Uh, and, but there's also courage happening in the negotiation rooms, too, in small little details, right? Small countries that step up, like when New Zealand backs, right, a comment from Colombia. Uh, these are tiny little details that matter. Now, you don't ever see that in media, right? Or if maybe if you read the reports, you might. But these tiny little details, these tiny little things do spark change. If there's Anything I think that this COP has shown us in a positive way is that it's shown us transparency, right? The limited access that observer uh, states and parties have has shown us we don't really know what's happening behind the scenes, not all the time. And we continue to talk about that. So now when I go back to my network and my circles and when all of you do the same thing and we're all talking together and we're on a stage, oh my God, we're speaking some real truth. So yeah, courage is happening every day. I don't think it looks, and it's not a big fuzzy showpiece that can be easily posted on social media that looks amazing, um, but it's there and it's alive and it's breathing and it's, these, it's this panel right here. And I also believe that as long as you're in this room, you have heard and a part of you inside there has been touched and the message has gotten to you. There's a seed that has been planted we urge you and advise you that you take the seed and plant it in another person, and then it will go on and on, and that's how the fire will continue burning. Thanks, Rebecca. Do we, Tressa, do we have another one from the online audience? I think there's one after this. I think there's one after. Yes, we do. More around funding and investments. So following on from that, um, we Jun from South Korea has asked, what can be done to encourage other organizations like the YMCA to invest and promote youth-led projects and climate action? Let's keep talking about it. Let's make noise however we can. We have been given a powerful tool which is social media. Let's just make noise. Violent noise I do not condone, but if you're going to be talking about it, posting it, and like I said, planting positive seeds in other people. 
some, some day this tree will grow and will bear fruit. And I, I, I just want to touch on that for a second. I sort of sit here as, on behalf of YMCA and, and kind of a personal commitment, I guess, organisational commitment, that, that elevating these stories and your successes, the work that you're doing, I think we're demonstrating, by demonstrating that impact, that change that you are making, we, it has power in itself because we're able to go and celebrate it and then go, hey, look what we did with quarter of a million dollars. Imagine what we could do with tenfold that. Rodrigo would go and build a thousand eco bases all across Peru and the world. You know, so I, I think we, we have to tell these stories, and I, I urge everyone here um, to, to stick around to watch uh, Creating Youth Led Solutions, our documentary. Um, for those online in the green zone um, on Friday on COP26's YouTube channel, at 3.30 p.m. UK time. But for me, that's, that's how we c uh, convince others to invest in youth-led solutions. We've got to work on the big corporates, though. I, I completely agree. I think, so when I think about youth, like what is a youth solution, really? You know, it's like this idea that young people have. And if you think about young people, think about how they have access to see the world in a capacity that the aged population no longer have access to. But the most beautiful thing about that is that the aged population also were once young people. So they have a concept of memory. And as a young person, so like young people over the world, and I think we're doing an okay job at doing this, um, you have to somehow be empathetic and share with a gatekeeper, which is like a power keeper, um, a memory or a relation that makes them feel drawn to making change. So to keep on, investing in solutions, I think young people are going to have to continue to do the work and it's going to have to happen every generation that comes after because we're going to be the problem in the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope that answered that question. Um, we are, we're coming close to time um, and I just wanted to, to finish on, um, I'd like to finish on something as tangible as possible um, and this is a real opportunity to plug, promote, um, push something that how can, how can people here in the room, how can people online, how can they actually help? If they walked away from here today and did one thing to support something or a piece of work that you're doing, personally or a, an organization you're connected with, what would that be? Now, Rodrigo, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna egg you on a little bit here with a, a website that I think you've built recently. Uh, I was actually thinking about that. Um, I. I do believe that we need to get to the big money, uh, corporate sectors, public sectors. But that being said, if you really are looking to help, um, there are some great youth-led solutions right here. I'm going to talk about mine. And if you really want to uh, reach out to us, you can do it as well over here. I'm going to stick around. I have a QR code that you can just scan. Or you can, you can go to our, our website, uh, which is, just give me a second. I forgot it, I had it on my mind. Sorry, I put you on the spot a little okay. bit there. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. So it's www.sumachmuru.com. Uh, it's S-U-M-A-Q-M-U-R-U. So we just built it up for you guys because as volunteers we didn't need one, but we got it. It was, um, it, it was just built up until today. And if you can just t take a look around, share it with people, um, I'm really happy to let, let people know about my project. Just that, that makes a great difference. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, Alicia, how, how, can, how could somebody in the room online, how could they help? What could they look at for you? Yeah, so um, in my studies, um, like I said, I'm studying law. And something that I guess we talk about policy so much that maybe we forget about how important law and legislation can, can take and that there's there can be huge push, and as maybe some people might know, uh, young people and um, charity groups and different organizations taking whole governments to court. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying you can go home and do that, maybe. Um, but um, if you want to do some research, research even on ecocide, which is you know um, people committing crimes against the environment, um, and there's fighters against ecocide, 
And just to look into that, because it, it doesn't always lie with politicians, it doesn't always lie with governments. Um, we can take it into our own hands, even in Ireland, just as a quick example, um, a group of active citizens, um, young and old, or maybe not old, <laughs> they'd be insulted I'm saying that, um, but a group of intergenerational uh, people, that's more Massive politically clear. correct, right? Um, <laughs> Took uh, took our government to court about our um, about a, a plan we had a climate uh, plan and they won and the plan was thrown out because it wasn't good enough and this is so possible um, so I know it can be inaccessible and the law can seem like this big scary thing um, but if it's a group of people who care I would like strongly recommend if you're interested in climate. Um, climate change and climate action that you know ecocide and learning about different mechanisms of change because it you know sometimes we can't always rely on policy and governments and politicians like there's other avenues of how we can enforce change against companies and businesses and against the government themselves uh, Rebecca one th uh, one thing that people in the room could do to help what can that what could they do what could they do to support things that you're working on so if, if there is anything that you want to do to help or support, for starters, I would love for you to just empathize and put yourself in other people's shoes. If that were you, what would you want somebody to do for you? Because I do not know how far you can go to help, so I'll ask you to empathize. Empathize with the people that I'm working with. I'm, not pr I'm a bit more privileged than they are, but there are people who, live, who go to bed on an empty stomach. And my initiative helps young children, the youth and the women, to make products out of things that we just pick from the environment, and I help them to sell them, and the money goes back to them. So just empathize. After you empathize, I'm sure you have um, a deep thought, and then you will be compelled to do something about it. So I'll, I'll just throw the ball back at you and say, when you empathize, I am around within this room, you can find me, and then we can talk from there. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Shaq. Yeah. Um, okay, so I guess to keep it really simple, when you leave today, and I, have, I get the vibe that everybody in this uh, ferry is probably with it, but find one person, mm -hmm. right? one person in your community, in your circle, that maybe needs help, that maybe doesn't have enough. Maybe you're planning to go on vacation and they can't afford it, you bring, it, you bring them with you, right? You, you share some of the privilege that you have. Um, and that leads me to the solution that we created in, in San Francisco at, the, at our YMCA Association, as we're, we've taken a critical look at ourselves and how we are part of the problem, right? What do we do? What are we investing in? As simple as where do I buy my paper from, right? If you have a lot of money and you're investing in stocks, what stocks am I invested in? How just are they? So I think you know, my solution is really for the global north, but look at yourself, critically analyze what you are a part of and the problem with it and start making those changes with yourself and find one other person to also, what Rebecca said, empathize with them and help them if they need help. Thanks, guys. Um, that, uh, can, we, can we put our hands together for our amazing panelists? Um, now, before we finish, we've got a couple of things. But the first is, uh, Rebecca said to me um, a couple of weeks ago, she said, I'm writing a song. I didn't know your musical. Uh, and actually, last night, we ended in song with, uh, with Kumi. And then uh, yesterday morning, an MP3 appears in my inbox, and I was just like, wow, okay, that's incredible. Uh, I mean, you haven't just written a song, you've, you've produced and recorded and, and the whole shebang. Um, so will you lead us out in song, sure. please? I would Thank love you. to. Okay, so this is a song that I wrote with my husband and my, my dad about the climate change and what we can do to bring in or maybe reduce and offer a solution. Okay, so I hope you listen with your heart and I hope I'll do a good job. <laughs> There's a bad wind blowing 
like never before. Living sorrows and tears as she goes. Cause we cut all of the trees that held and cooled things down. There's a sad song playing in the wind. Oceans are rising and are polluted with waste. The earth is simply crying out for help. It has no mouth of its own, yet the message is clear. There's a sad song playing in the wind. Can you hear that sad song? Sad song in the wind. I can hear a sad song in the wind. But if we can all work together, we can save our planet Earth. There'll be no sad song playing in the wind. I said, if we can all just work together, we can save humanity. And there'll be no sad song playing in the wind. Wow. Um, so uh, thank you so much for joining us for this panel. Uh, what's going to uh, happen in, in a minute is uh, hopefully you're all going to stick with us and go to the bar, grab a drink, stick around, because uh, we're going to show a special in Glasgow only preview of our documentary, uh, Creating Youth-Led Solutions. Uh, and we're really, really pr uh, privileged and excited that Reese Lewis is going to be joining us a little bit later on as well for a uh, exclusive performance. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for this panel. We're going to finish with the trailer for everybody online, like I said, the COP26 YouTube channel, Friday 15.30. For those of you not with us here in Glasgow, we wish you were. Uh, but for everybody else, stick around, head to the bar um, and enjoy the trailer. Thank you. It makes you wonder what kind of a world we will live for, for the next generation. I'd like to think of us as global citizens rather than local citizens. But if you want to have great leaders of tomorrow, the leaders of now have to be great. They have to do action. They have to inspire. It's more than a project. It's an potent idea that creates the transformation of resources and organic materials that we all collect in a new opportunity to construct something from this trash, we turn it into treasure. I feel happy that this program has been started at our school in my time. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be part of that team to make it to reach its fruition. We will no longer wait to grow up, to have the fancy titles, to have the years of experience. Maybe we cannot run the forestation 100%, but each of us can plant some trees and uh, make this process less impactful, uh, in this case, deforestation. If people will not act together towards our goal to have a sustainable environment, everything we have and the future of our children will perish. If people know that we are in a crisis, then they'll be able to act differently. Climate change is not going to wait for us, and neither should we. <laughs>